Hi, so uh, this talk is less about how to improve accuracy and similar metrics than uh, what happens with most of the models that we are using uh, right now. So I will be talking about deep learning in the land of, of adversity. So if you consider these two pictures, uh, maybe you cannot see any difference between them. But if you throw them to your favorite model, let's say a residual network 101, which is one of the best models available out there, uh, then the predictions will be completely different, right? So for the first one, we will predict that this is a Kelpie, and the second one, that this is a Chihuahua. So this is one example of lack of robustness of neural networks, especially for classification, to carefully designed perturbation called adversarial perturbation. So this is, a, this is a problem and not just because this type of thing may affect the feelings of the Kelpie or the Chihuahua depending on which one you prefer, but um, it goes actually beyond classification, right? So recently we did some work with colleagues showing that even for more structured prediction problems such as semantic segmentation you can have two images, the top images, which look similar, very similar. And the first, the, the one on the, on the right, on your right, is uh, exactly the first one to which we added some noise. And uh, the segmentation produced for the first one is rather correct, while for the second one, the perturbation is designed specifically so that the model produces a perturbation that is actually a minion. And this is a real example. It also happens with speech recognition problems. So if you take an automatic speech recognizer uh, based on a neural network, you can design perturbation that you inject on the audio file. And we made some tests to ensure that even humans cannot make the difference between the perturbed and the original audio file uh, through AB, ABX testing. And then you can still see that the spectrograms look very similar in this case, the corresponding spectrograms. But when, the, when this is fed to a model, the transcriptions are completely different. And this is true even for the best speech recognizers available out there. So if you consider Google Voice and you take an audio file, you play it in front of Google Voice. If this is the correct transcription, by the way, this is a real example. So if this is the correct correct transcription, if you play the audio file um, in front of your Google Voice, then you will have a transcription like this, which is almost co completely correct. But if you play the perturbed sample, the perturbed version, which cannot be distinguished from the original one by a human, this is what you get, right? And again, this was realized, uh, this uh, um, experiment was realized in a completely black box setting. We don't have access to Google Voice, right? Uh, so this is a problem, I think, and not just because of a security problem which people usually talk about, but I think it's, it's a good occasion or and a, a good excuse for us to investigate more what these models are doing and what, what are the properties of the functions they are learning and, uh, and, and this type of things, right? So how is the noise generated in these cases? So in general, since these models are non-convex, to generate the noise, we just start for a, for a given example. Uh, consider an, a ball, a LP ball around the example, and find a direction of descent um, that maximizes the loss function, right? Uh, and uh, you know the ball is considered tiny enough, the radius is small enough, so that the perturbation is not perceptible by a human. So you can, you can, depending on the type of ball, you consider there are variation of these approaches. You can consider L infinity or L2 balls, and you can perform the attack iteratively, etc. Right. So this is this is very simple, and just by generating the noise this way, you can uh, easily change the decision of your model. So why does this happen? Uh, there are two things in play here. You have the data and you have the model, 
represented by its parameters, right? So if we want to prevent these type of things from happening, we can act either on the model or on the parameter uh, or on the data itself, right? So let's start with the model. So normally this is what we want to ideally, had we known the joint distribution from the which the data is generated, this is ideally what we want to minimize. We want to minimize the risk, right? Uh, so if we have infinite capacity and we know the we know the, the generating distribution, then this is what we would do. But unfortunately, we don't. So we do an empirical risk minimization to which we add a regularization term to constrain the um, the complexity of the model. But usually, this does not result in a robust model, right? So most of the models that I have shown previously, they are trained this way with various types of regularization, but the resulting model is not robust. Uh, so recently, some authors, actually many authors, uh, in concurrent studies have proposed to train the model explicitly uh, making it robust to adversarial perturbation by not only training on the examples that we have, but also by generating adversarial examples and training on them, right? So uh, this, for people working in stats, this is a classic robust optimization problem. But again, this does not really make the models robust. There are attempts, uh, it, it definitely increases the performance, but it doesn't really make the models uh, significantly more robust than they already are, right? So there is this old idea as well, which to which uh, all of this is related, which is vicinal risk minimization. I think it's a NIPS 2000 paper by uh, Olivier Chappelle, Jason Weston, and Vladimir and Leon, which somehow factorizes the joint distribution and makes assumption about a P of, X, uh, on P of Xi. So for every example, you instead of optimizing on X, you pose a, a density on X and generate examples from it um, and learn your model with those examples. Right? So depending on how you choose P of Xi, you end up having different models. So for linear models, actually, you can show that if your P of Xi is a Gaussian, it's just a rich regression. And I think this is pretty basic. So the problem is how would you choose P of Xi and P of Y, uh, uh, the, the marginals, P, P Xi and P I I, um, to, to make your model robust, right? So this is, this is another challenge. So I will show uh, an approach, a very simple one, that can be related to all of these things, at least to the last last two. Um, for the interest of time, I will skip the the derivation that leads to this method. So it it looks at first like a stupid thing to do, but I promise you it works. Uh, so here it is. So what we recently proposed is not to train on the examples. But instead of training on the examples, consider a pair of examples and generate new examples by taking convex combination of the pairs of examples. You can consider as well taking more than two examples, right? And train a model to predict the convex combination of the targets. So what does this mean? It means that if you have a, a picture of a dog and a picture of a cat, <coughs> you don't train the model to predict dog given a picture of a dog or cat given a picture of a cat, but you train the model to predict this for this, trend, this strange creature, like here, that this is 40% of a cat and 60% of a dog. So what does this mean? Uh, again, I mean, for the interest of time, I will skip the the what does what this really means mathematically. But what it means is that uh, you draw a line between two points, and you sample any point on that line, and you consider the target being the convex combination of the labels. So you assume that the measure is zero everywhere else, except on places where you can uh, generate co corresponding to convex combination of samples belonging to your training data, right? 
And you can show actually that doing this somehow constrains the Lipschitz constant of the function that you're learning to be upper bounded by some something, right? W if, if you're interested in the details, we can have a discussion later. So if you train the mo your model doing, by doing this, you, let's, you take, let's say you take a, uh, the, the same network I talked about before, uh, a residual network, and you train a model using what we call here mix-up, so which, which is just mixing the examples and the labels and trying to predict them. So if you look at what's happening, if you consider two points, when you train with mix-up, compared to when you train using the vanilla empirical risk minimization, you see that between the points, the loss is smaller, right? So when you train using empirical risk minimization, so you have one point here, one point here, when you interpolate between them, you, s you see that in the middle of the two points, then the loss is, is, is very high, right? But when you train with mix-up, non-surprisingly, it's a smaller. The loss is smaller. But most interestingly, you have more invariance because the gradient, the norm of the gradient, if you measure it between any two points, uh, after training your model, it's much smaller than uh, what it is when you train with, with uh, empirical risk minimization. So this is the main effect of doing this. And also, it, it tells you something about, because this is the norm of the gradient, so it's, it's, a, it's an upper bound of the Lipschitz constant. So if you take a max uh, on all your data points, you, you can see clearly that, that that's what it does, actually. So doing this also, we find that it makes the model more robust to corrupted labels, right? If you, if you take your example and with some probability you flip the label of every example, and if you train your model uh, with undercorrupted label versus you train the model on the corrupted labels but doing this mix-up, then it makes the model much more robust to this perturbation. But again, that still makes sense because uh, if, you, if you take convex combination of points, even if you flip the label, just taking convex combination of labels as well in combination to points is what gives you the unbiased estimator. So it, it sort of makes sense uh, still. But this is not, so y you can see clearly here uh, that on a bunch of data sets, it, it actually improves the, the, the accuracy uh, of your models. Uh, these are state-of-the-art results on CIFAR. Uh, it's the same on speech recognition. It, it basically, actually, it's just two lines of code that you add to your, to your model, like to your code base, and it literally improves all your accuracies without much tuning. The code is available online, you can try it. But actually, this is not what is interesting. Uh, so this is an ImageNet, so still gives you the best results that you can have on ImageNet without even changing your architecture. Uh, if you're into GANs, so if you train your discrimin the discriminator of your GAN not to predict whether it is um, it comes from the distribution generate uh, the, the generator or from the normal uh, one, but by uh, trying to predict the the combination, the mixing coefficients then it, it also seems to stabilize again for some reasons. But here is what I, where I want to come. So when we initially did this, the reason was to, to achieve invariance in some directions, right? So because we initially tried to achieve invariance, given a data point to achieve invariance in any di direction, uh, but the person who was working on this, whose name is Hongi Zhang, who was an intern at FAIR, uh, said that the interesting directions are those that go to other point of the data set, right? So that's why we actually did this. And we found out that it results in models that are much more robust, even though it was not the initial intent, to adversarial examples. What does that mean? That means that if you have enough training data, making your model invariant in the direction of the other training data makes the model more robust. And you can actually show that the norm of the perturbation that you need in order to flip the decision depends on several quantities among which the, 
the, the minimum distance that you can have between points belonging to different categories and also to some properties of the model uh, related to the, to the normals of the gradient. But even though it is the case that it makes it more robust, especially here to black box attacks, one thing that we observed and which is consistent with all the other approaches that have been proposed in the literature is that no matter how well you try to control the regularity or the smoothness of the function that you're learning, it doesn't actually result in a model that is robust if you consider a white box setting. Which is if your adversary knows the model, all the parameters of the model, and, and you know, does a gradient descent in the examples and generate the noise while knowing the, the, the model, then you can see clearly that you can, um, if, if you allow the adversary to, to have some, uh, some power, which is the, the norm of the perturbation, if, if it can be uh, large enough or if the adversary can use an iterative approach in order to generate the noise, then you can still completely fool the model, whether it is the traditional ERM with the uh, re uh, usual regularization procedures or this mix-up or, or whatever approach, right? So this, what it says is that if we try to make the models more robust by looking from the uh, perspective of the models and from a regularization perspective, we can achieve it up to some degree. But this is not the whole story, it doesn't really solve the problem. That's at least so far what we have observed. Uh, and it says something about the building blocks of these models. Maybe they are not intrinsically robust and maybe we need something else. So we turned out to look into what happens if you act on the model, on the data itself. So what we want, if you look at the data, from the data perspective, you ideally want your a transformation, like given an example that may or may not be perturbed adversarially, you want a transformation that uh, that basically removes the noise if if there is any noise, or that is just uh, identity if there is no noise, right? So this is this is basically what we what you want ideally. So if you have such a transformation, then if there is an ad additive noise, uh, uh, adversarial noise to your example, it will just remove it. So there are many transformations that one can consider. You can consider usual transformations in image processing, JPEG compression, reducing the depth of the bits, cropi using cropping or ensemble of cropped uh, examples. But here we just try to consider instead very simple transformations uh, that are well-known in image processing, which are here total variance minimization and image quilting. So this is just a denoising, the total variance minimization, and image quilting, which consists in replacing, selecting patches in the image and replacing them with other patches, right? So if you manage to reconstruct the image by replacing all the patches with other patches, then ultimately you will completely remove the, the adversarial noise. Right. So let's start with this uh, total variance minimization. So this is very simple. You perturb the randomly perturb the example and try to reconstruct it with a uh, with a regularization, a total variance regularization. So this is uh, well known. We know how to solve this. You can use split fragment approaches, and there are efficient solvers for it, um, and it works pretty well, as I will show. Uh, image quilting, so what we did with image quilting is we considered a database of one million patches which we which we create and then store it and we, we actually, ca you can consider actually that this database of patches is somehow a secret key because the adversary may not have uh, access to it even if she has access to the to the model, to all the parameters of the model and given an image, what you do is you replace uh, every patch of the image with a random uh, patch belonging to the top k nearest neighbors of this patch sampled from your database of patches. So if you do this, you can see that, in fact, from a security point of view, it, it actually complies with the, what's called the Kirchhoff's um, law, which is that it's 
a crypto system should be secure even if everything about the system except the key is public knowledge, right? So here the key can be considered to be this database of patches. So far, what's the, the dominated, dominating setting to test the robustness of the models called the white box setting considers that you know everything about the model, but by everything in all papers, it means you know the model's parameters, but here if you know the model's parameters without knowing the, the, that secret key, which is the, the database of patches, then you, you may not really succeed at attacking the model, and then we'll see how it goes. So basically, so here is a, an illustration of what it looks like once you transform the images. So you have the original, you have the original image here. Uh, the same image when you transform it using the TV minimization, and the same image when you do quilting. Right. So basically, these two images look very much uh, like each other, but this is a completely reconstructed image from a private uh, database of patches. So the, it's, it's, it's very small patches of size five by five. So you may not really see the difference, but if you take the difference between the, um, the original image and the, and the quilted image, you see here that the two images are very different. Same for, for this one, at least for the perturbed version, right? So what, what do we have with this? So if we take a model that is already trained with the natural images and at prediction time, instead of using the images, the XIs, we use the transformed images, and we attack the model, which is we generate adversary examples based on the, uh, the, the normal images and then apply the transformation. Here is what we have. So this line here, so the x-axis is the strength of the adversary, which is the norm of the perturbation. The y-axis is the accuracy of the model. So this is basically the 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 model the original mo the model tested on the original examples which are perturbed by the adversary uh, each of these figures is actually uh, actually corresponds to a different way of designing the adversarial perturbation so there are many of them like you have fast gradient sign iterative fast gradient sign but it's it's basically just different flavors of doing gradient descent in the input space it's nothing really fancy so what we can see here is that if you do quilting, right, or TV minimization or cropping, an ensemble of cropping, it already significantly reduces the success rate of the adversary. Because uh, when you don't apply any of these transformations, this is the how your performance uh, decreases. Right? And all of these three are actually much more robust than doing just JPEG compression or reducing the depth. So one thing you can do in addition to this is not only to use them at prediction time, but also train the model while applying the transformation. And if you do that, you can see clearly here that the model becomes much more robust when you apply these transformations, right? Especially when you do the uh, total variance minimization. So in this case, it's a black box attack, which means that the, the adversary does not know uh, the parameters of the model. So the adversary has access to its own model, so generate adversarial example and transfers it to your model. But if the adversary knows the parameters of the model but not the private key, which is the database of patches, then it can still attack the model, but as you can see, using uh, image quilting helps everywhere. Right? It makes the model much more robust. So we actually um, compare this. This is just training a ResNet 50 uh, on, on this type of transformations and, and using, um, uh, comparing it to state-of-the-art models as far as robustness is concerned. And in a white box setting, which is the adversary knows the whole model, all the parameters of the model, in our case, except the database of patches, and what we can see is that, by far, this is uh, much more robust than what is considered uh, being a, uh, the most robust model in the literature, which is the ensemble adversarial training. But again, the ensemble adversarial training is very robust in black box setting, but not at all in white box setting. 
um, which is what we target here. But still, going from 60 something of accuracy to 51 of accuracy is still uh, uh, some reduction in performance. So the problem is completely not so. Yeah. Can I ask a question before you go on? Uh, yes. So you were, uh, I'm wondering if the power of the method is coming from the fact that it's non-parametric and you don't know the patches in the database, or because you do stochastic nearest neighbor reconstruction? Both. So we have ablative studies. Uh, the problem with not doing stochastic nearest neighbor is if you train the model on the reconstructed images using, uh, Im using quilting, the patches leak on the model. W what that means is that if you don't do stochastic uh, nearest neighbor, then just, just injecting the noise in the input changes as well the nearest, the nearest neighbor structure of, of, the, um, of the patches themselves, right? So somehow it leaks in the model. So, but it's not the whole story. Actually, you, you have to, you, it is still more robust than this, but you have to, you have to use both. You have to, it's, it's non-parametric in a sense because you are using every example. You can have actually many versions of the same example and do ensembling because you have a quasi-infinite um, database of patches. But uh, yeah, it's a combination of both. But I'm curious, like if the attacker knew the database of patches but didn't know which one randomly picked, then it's the only defense is this that's right? Is Absolutely. That, is that enough? Absolutely. It's, it's not enough. Yeah. It's not enough. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it's, it's arguable whether uh, having such a huge database of patches can be considered as a secret key. Because Ideally, a secret key is something very small, and it's. But that's a different question. It's a, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so far, this is the most appealing uh, defense that exists against this adversary. Example: It's completely model agnostic. It adds a, uh, a, an additional layer of security. It's. It has low complexity, uh, computational complexity overhead. You can com combine it with any defense that you have in mind because it operates at the data sp stage and it gives you state of the art results. So you can find the code online and the paper is also online. Um, so what I want to talk about now is how these examples, these adversary examples, can be used to understand more the data that we train the models on and also to improve our understanding of the models and what they have actually learned uh, after training, right? So once we go beyond accuracy. So I, I like to see these adversary examples actually as, a, as an excuse to study the models and try to analyze them a bit and see what they have learned, what are the properties, etc. So here, I want to pre present you so a set of experiments that we run. The first one is the following. So if you learn a neural network on a set of examples, you can try to explain the predictions by doing some sensitivity analysis. I'm not going uh, into details of how we did that, but you can try to explain, you know, to do and to provide ex extractive explanation uh, um, of a prediction given an example. There are many ways of doing it. Um, so if you do it, what happens if you do it for a, for a, a normal, a legitimate example, and a perturbed version of that example, an adversarially perturbed version of that example. So take, take this example, uh, take this image, for example. So this image, it's normally labeled as a Jeep, right? If you take it, it's, it's extra extracted from ImageNet. You, it's ground truth label is Jeep. Yeah, so the grand truth label of this image is JIP. And if you run your explanation uh, procedure, uh, the model gets it right. It predicts that this is a JIP. And if you run your explanation procedure, this is what you have, right? And if you add adversarial perturbation to the image, the, mo the model now predicts ambulance. But if you generate the explanation of that prediction, this is what you have. So what does that mean? <coughs> that means that what happens when you generate 
uh, when most of the time, at least on ImageNet, when you add adversarial perturbation to an image, it actually shifts the attention of the model into a, an area that is reminiscent of another category. Here it's an it's a, um, ambulance. And in fact, we, we took this, um, this, these predictions, right? The, the, the predictions given by the model when the, when the input is adversarially perturbed. And we show for every image, for the 50,000 images of the uh, um, uh, ImageNet test set, we show every image together with the prediction given for the adversarial, adversarially perturbed version of it to five different persons. And we ask them if the prediction makes sense, if they agree with the predictions. And in 25% of the cases, at least four out of the five persons considered that what the model has predicted, which is no different from the grand truth, is actually right. So this means that the robustness, sometimes it is due to the way we design the ground truth and the way we supervise the model. So a second experiment is that if we use the, if we predict, if we take the labels predicted by the adversarial, uh, uh, for the adversarial uh, examples, and we submit not the images but the explanations given by the model for those images, for those predictions to humans, what we see is the following, right? So we, we see that for many of them, so let, let's say this one, for example, it's, it's a similar. Uh, in this case, the model predicts a uh, police van. And when we ask the humans when, whether this is a police van, only 20% of them, 20%, uh, which means like one out of five, uh, on average says that yes, this, this makes sense. Like it makes sense that the model would say police van, right? Uh, because it looks like a police van even though it may not be. But if we take the explanation given by the model when it, the model says police van and we show it to humans, all of them, 100% of them sa says that it makes sense that the model predicts police van, right? So we did it for all of the images and the results are quite consistent that when you show to humans the the predict the explanations given by the model for uh, for some predictions what what you have uh, actually makes sense to them which means that if the yeah if the humans see the the images the same way the models see them it, they will just make the same mistakes so this is actually another uh, another experiments which is this is the last one uh, so we use adversary examples to for a given concept that is learned so here it's the category basketball we, we use adversary examples to extract what is called prototypes and critics right so prototypes is just what the model consider as being prototypical to the concept and the critics are like what is at the near the decision boundaries of uh, for this concept so uh, maybe you cannot see much here but actually what happens is that if you take the images, all the images in, in ImageNet that are labeled basketball, and you take the model, uh, state-of-the-art model trained on this, you consider the prototypical images, you will see that 90% uh, of these prototypical images only contains black people, and uh, for the critics, more than 70-something uh, percent of them only contain white people, even though in the data set, the, the ethnicity is balanced. So we tested this, we collected pairs of images that all other things being equal uh, look similar except the, the skin tone. And you can see that whenever the person is, is uh, black, the model predicts basketball, and whenever the person is not, it predicts something else. Actually, this is just one instance of this type of bias that we find in the model. We find that on ImageNet, when the model is trained on these images, it always predicts uh, uh, ping pong when it's an Asian and basketball when it's a black person. And it's like there are many, many of these types of biases that we found. So this is uh, some images we sampled from the <laughs> internet. Uh, and, and in both cases, this is the, the highest, uh, highest scoring class. So it's, this is what it predicts, right? Uh, so conclusion, these models are all but intelligence. They may be accurate, but they're still very dumb. Uh, so, uh, and the second takeaway is, 
obviously b uh, that the adversarial examples can be used for something else other than security to study the, the, what the models actually have learned. So you can find the paper online uh, uh, summarizing this study. This is joint work with many people from bar -Ilan University, MIT, Cornell, and some of my colleagues at FAIR. Thank you. Thank you very much. So because uh, we need to move to the other talk, so uh, please uh, maybe click, click uh, one click uh, is fine. Yeah. In the first part of your talk, yeah, did you try to take convex combination of the ten? Yeah, we did. So for small data sets, it helps. For large data sets, it doesn't help as much. So you have there is some diminishing return effect uh, when the data set big is big. So what systematically help is uh, taking two or three combinations of, of, uh, of examples rather than uh, yeah. Okay, so let's uh, keep the uh, discussion offline. So let's thank the speaker again.